since the last train had already departed from the station city of the Holy Gate Mira had to spend a night there. The next day, she woke up early in the morning and began walking around the station, looking for souvenirs while waiting for the train that departs at noon. As it was the station city of the Holy Kingdom of Alasphirius, the entire building was white and the interior design resembled that of a temple, giving the place an air of purity. However, the interior was already filled with travelers and people moving around since early in the morning, making the place appear more lively. Amidst that the sound of a bell rang before an announcement about the state of the trains was broadcasted. A train had arrived on the left lane. Mira had arrived there on a train in the left lane as well, and the train would be heading towards Grimdart. Her way home was in the opposite direction, so she could simply ignore that announcement. This place has some rather lively noises. Mira watched an on-rush of passengers to the platform as her ears caught the trio of noises formed by the steam whistle, the bell and the low rumble of multiple people walking at the same time. Seeing as most of the people in the station had boarded the train while leaving the buildings largely empty, Mira decided to use that moment to look at the different shops. The first store in line was a souvenir store. When compared to the souvenir store of the station city of Silverside in Arkite which was closest to this one, the items sold were entirely different. Since this was inside the Holy Kingdom, most of the items were holy books or charms with the holy symbols engraved in them. Even things like these are being sold as souvenirs. Muttering that to herself, Mira took a small statue of a goddess of love in her hand and began examining it closely. The statue had peachy-colored hair in a multiple-layered angelic dress as it represented a goddess of love. The statue's face was that of a beautiful woman with a warm smile like a sunny day in spring. The carving was most exquisite and the workman's skill was apparent in multiple places. It was a really well-made idol. She then tilted the statue a bit, muttered their white heart to herself, then returned the statue to its place before heading to the food section. One of Alice Furious's most well-known produce was pure white peaches, so there were many pastries and drinks made with that on display. What should I buy? After a look around the store, she picked up some pure white peach cookies, jam and juice of all types for everyone who helped produce the magic rope set. Afterwards, she chose souvenirs for Mariana and Creos, then some for Solomon and Luminaria, and lastly some for herself as well. In total, all she bought added up to around 80 feet oo rills. When that was done, she just wandered around window shopping. While she was inside a bookstore, she looked around to make sure no one else was there before standing on her tiptoes trying to reach a high shelf. Then she bought the follow-up volumes for the manga series she had liked out of the last batch she bought. She was really enjoying her leisure life to its fullest. As time passed, people slowly began to assemble in the station once again. When the announcement saying that there was one hour left before the train in the right lane arrived was broadcasted, Mira took it as her signal to head to the lively food aisle. It's all white. The white staple of the Holy Kingdom applied to even their food. She took a look around the entire place to burn it and add her traveling memories, then she bought an unusual lunch box of raw spring rolls and then added some tea she bought for 200 rolls to it. Once she had everything she needed, she began heading towards the platform only to notice she had forgotten to buy tickets. She had been so engrossed in getting souvenirs that it had completely slipped her mind. Oh right, oh right. She checked her menu to see how much time she had left, and seeing there was still more than enough, she calmly headed to buy her tickets. She lined up at the counter of a gentle-looking lady and waited for her turn. There were a couple of people ahead of her, but when her turn arrived, she began rummaging through the leather bag she used as a wallet and spoke to the lady. I'd like to buy tickets. Since Myra's head barely peeked out from the corner, the lady thought she was a girl coming for an errand and unknowingly relaxed her expression. Which type? Economy, premium, or first class? First. As Mira counted the 100 feet oo rails for the fare, her hand stopped. She no longer had enough money to pay for it. HMPHH, I spent too much. Mira pouted as she examined the interior of her wallet. Mira began thinking about the card game, then the souvenirs and everything she bought. Ah, uh, I meant five economy tickets, please. All right, that'll be 25 feet oo rails. After calculating how much she would need to stay in inns for three days during her trip back, Mira bought five economy class tickets. This is an announcement from the Continental Train. A train is about to arrive on the right lane, the stoppage time is one hour so please take the due precautions to board on time. This is an announcement from the... As soon as the announcement was broadcasted, everyone in the station crowded together and moved as one towards the platform. Mira slipped into that crowd and arrived at the platform with them. Oh, so this is the entrance to the economy class section, I assume? The entrance was completely different to that for first class. Due to the large influx of people, the economy entrance had multiple parallel divisions with devices to check the tickets almost automatically. Everyone was split into around 10 lines, separated by the pillar-like devices, and crossing that they finally arrived at the platform. The platform was around the size of an average school's main building, the ceiling, walls and floor covered in white stone tiles. Mira was still trying to comprehend her surroundings as she was moved on autopilot joining one of the lines. There were so many people around her that she could barely see a few meters ahead of her. Mira hesitantly walked forward, her mind filled with uncertainty just like when a student joins a new classroom and has to sit waiting for the teacher to arrive. Ten minutes passed since she began lining up. 
Mira was able to see that those ahead of her were sliding their tickets into a slit on the pillars that resembled the marks of an axe on a tree. That was enough for her to understand what to do, so she relaxed her stiff shoulders, took out the tickets from her waist pouch and waited for her turn to arrive. It should be pretty much the same as an automatic ticket gate. She was convinced that someone must have used the entirely automated train stations of the real world as reference when building these. The line moved forward and it was finally Myra's turn. She kept telling herself that she just had to do the same as everyone else and it would be fine. The slit was located on a somewhat high spot so it was hard to reach for Mira who had to lift her arms to slide her tickets in. When she did, there was a faint glow and something like a magic circle was engraved on the tickets. Hmm, I wonder what this means now. Mira stared at the ticket, observing the faint magic power concealed in it but she was pushed from behind and she exited the ticket gates and ended on the platform. The platform itself was built out of bare stone, and while it gave off a simple impression, it was around 400 meters from one end to the other. It was much larger than the first-class platform. When she took a better look at it, she saw that the station's employees had made a barrier with a rope, separating the platform in two. The rope was of course, also white. It looks really lively. One side of that separation was still completely empty. Once the train was there, there could be up to a thousand people boarding and coming out from the train, so that separation would help divide the float people to agilize the movement. The station staff raised their voices while ordering where people should go. Mira could feel the bodily heat from all those people around her as she followed the staff orders and crossed to the other side of the white rope. Soon after she heard the steam whistle blowing from far away and slowly getting closer. Every time the whistle blew, it would sound louder until eventually it was so strong it seemed to shake all the air inside the building. The steel locomotive, shaped like the helmet of a warrior that kept moving forward with nothing that could stop it, entered the station. As it braked, the shrill sound of steel rubbing against steel reverberated inside the platform, as if announcing the triumphal return of a king. Afterwards the rest of the train wagons made their entrance as well. The presence of those black frames was truly overpowering, and while their movements seemed slow and dull, they still caused strong currents of air that wildly distorted the clothing and hair of those present. It's quite long. When it stopped everything went silent, only a low grazing noise left. Mira muttered to herself in awe, looking at the train from one end to another standing like a sturdy wall in front of her. There were ten wagons in total. The one in the front was the first class one, then two premium class, and the remaining seven were all economy class. While Mira kept admiring that incredible scene, there were passengers coming out one after another seemingly endlessly from the train. The entire platform was covered with people in the blink of an eye. That sea of people was then divided into two streams, one of which began leaving through an exit. People continued coming out of the train for a few dozens of minutes. There were so many people there that Mira once again felt crushed but after her experience with the crowd earlier, it was much more bearable now. Please listen to the staff's instructions, don't push and board the train in order. The station staff began giving orders in a loud voice. She felt like she was participating in a large event and she followed the orders as closely as she could. The doors of the economy class wagons were large enough for at least three adults to enter side by side at the same time. There were also two doors per wagon, one on the front and one on the back. Following the staff's instructions, Mira boarded the fifth wagon through the front door. Once she crossed the door, she was greeted with a dank smell that was like a mixture of wood and iron. There was also a set of stairs there since the economy class wagons were divided into three floors. Thinking the scenery would look better from a high place, Mira nimbly climbed the stairs. The seats inside the economy class wagon were arranged in rows of three on each side and with every four rows there was a passage on the sides. It was the same arrangement as the seats in a plane but the materials used were wooden fabric so it resembled more of the waiting room of a mansion. People were taking seats at a rapid pace already but Mira was still able to catch one beside a window. Twenty minutes passed during which more people boarded the train. At that moment, Mira caught sight from the corner of her a lady with blonde hair standing in the corridor. Is it okay if I sit beside you? The lady spoke to the charming girl with an appearance that rivaled that of cherry blossoms in full bloom, who was sitting with her cheek pressed against the window. Her appearance suggested she was in her late teens or early twenties and she wore a white and blue apron dress as well as a white cape that swayed behind her. There were also multiple ornaments sewn into her clothing which looked more like highlights than simple ornaments. It gave her get-up a bizarre look that would fit in perfectly beside the white rabbit in Wonderland. Sure, I don't mind. Mira turned her gaze from the window to the lady and replied with a clear voice. She then stretched a bit and pressed herself a bit more against the window, increasing the already sufficient space in the seats. Thank you. Seeing Myra's action, the lady resisted heaving a sigh before she sat down beside her. When she did that the fluttering of her clothes caused a sweet, fruity scent to reach Mira. You know, you're pretty cute. The lady said that as she turned to look at Mira with a friendly smile. Obviously. Mira replied with a slight smile. Her own appearance had been Myra's best masterpiece, so she was never afraid to feel proud about it in front of others. But when Mira looked closer at the lady's face, the light passing through the window reflecting on her eyes and glistening like gems, her hair interwoven with the sunlight, Mira was fascinated herself. Ah ha ha, you're pretty funny. I'm Teresa, what's your name? I'm Mira. Mira, her. Ah, can I take a picture of you? 
Teresa smiled innocently as she lowered a bag from her shoulder and took a box-shaped object from it. It had a protrusion in the center housing a lens covered with a lid which Teresa then uncovered. Oh, is that a camera? Yes, it is. Does it bother you? I don't really mind. Mira was aware that photographs could be taken in that world, but she was still interested since this was her first time seeing a camera, hence she consented to it. Teresa smiled as she exclaimed thanks and took the camera. Then she put it just in front of her face. I'll take one now Tilda. When Mira heard that, she faced the camera and tried to strike a cool pose like she used to do during her time as Dan Wolf. Ah, just try to act normal if you can. Seeing Mira acting in such an ungirly way, Teresa frowned while slightly bewildered. HMPH, having been captured in a photograph while not in her signature pose, Mira looked slightly displeased. I got some really nice pictures now, thank you. Teresa smiled brightly as she expressed her gratitude, looking honestly pleased. Mira did not smile, as she usually looked calm and serious that used to create a more striking figure after all. I'm the public relations manager at Magical Nights. We have an exhibit soon, feel free to come check us out if you want. She stashed the camera back in the bag, placed it on her lap and fixed her sitting posture. Then she smiled and said that to Mira with a slight tilt of her head. Magical Nights her. First time hearing that name. Mira replied to her as her gaze escaped outside the window once again. Air, it's the clothing brand that's trending at the moment, we focus mostly on magical girl style clothes, just like the ones I'm wearing right now. As Teresa explained, she spread her arms so her clothes were more visible. Urged on by her, once Mira took a better look at it she remembered seeing multiple people wearing similar clothes in all the cities she had visited, so it was obviously a popular design. I see, so that's where all of that came from. Mira was amazed, almost blown away at how that trend had managed to spread to almost all cities, even if that was their goal in the first place. Your clothes also have a similar style, but are they custom made? I've been intrigued by them for a while now. Well, that's pretty much it. The robe set Mira was wearing had been made by the maids of the castle who had used the magical girl look as a basis. So in a way, they were of the same style. The train on the right lane is departing now. Please be mindful of swaying in the train, so hold on to the hand rests if needed. The train on the right lane. Time flew past while they were engaged in conversation, and after the chime of a bell, the announcement of the departure of the train was broadcasted. The ambience inside the economy wagons was much more boisterous compared to first class, and many adventurers could be seen inside it. Some passengers seemed to be first-time riders as they began celebrating like in a festival as soon as the train began moving. Feeling inertia gently pressing her body against the seat, Mira continued listening to those voices that were loud but not to the point of being annoying. A short while after the train departed, the two continued talking about clothes. Though rather than a conversation, it was mostly Teresa speaking while Mira just nodded and kept her going. Hearing more of the story of the magical girl trend in that world was something Mira was interested in knowing more of given that she still lacked a lot of knowledge about it. That looks really tasty. I'm not giving you any. Teresa muttered with her mouth watering as she saw Mira take out her spring roll lunchbox, her eyes filled with jealousy. Mira shot her down instantly, hugging the lunchbox and turning around as if hiding it before taking a bite out of one of the rolls. Teresa had already eaten her own lunch and was now reluctantly scraping off the last remains from the corners of her box. Seriously, all right, you can have this. Mira saw from the corner of her eye how Teresa began looking like a puppy with its ears down and licking an empty bowl. After which she decided to offer her some of the muscat cookies she had bought at one point earlier. Thank you. Teresa took the cookies instantly and without hesitation, looking even more like a happy puppy now. This looks really peaceful. Looking out from the window, a forest filled the scenery, going further away and disappearing in the distance. The sky was mostly clear with a few specks of clouds sprinkled around as if put there by short brush strokes on a painting. In contrast to that the interior of the train was still really noisy and there was the smell of alcohol wafted in the air. I heard fuzzy dice appeared somewhere around Grimdart. It was impossible to discern who had said that out of all the concurrent voices, but Mira still caught a name she had heard not too long ago. That voice was also soon overtaken by a shrill voice, but Mira remembered where she saw that name and took out the Phantom Thief fuzzy dice card. By the way, do you know this person? Saying that, she showed the card to Teresa who was still stuffing her cheeks with cookies. Teresa quickly nodded, still chewing on the cookies, and then began searching for something in her bag. Of course I know him. That's the awesome Phantom Thief Fuzzy Dice. He's really popular lately, there was even an event surrounding him recently. Finally gulping down the cookies, Teresa replied as she took out a notebook from her bag, then searched for a picture in it to show Mira. The picture was of a group of around ten people, all wearing a similar costume to that in the card and wearing carnival masks. It was basically a group cosplay picture. So this is, in the center of the group stood none other than Teresa. Mira was unsure what to say as she looked at everyone there, a wrinkle forming on her forehead. Well, I see, but well, what kind of person is he? In the end, Mira decided to not inquire about the picture, but instead showed the card more prominently and asked. You don't know him? Well, he doesn't show up too much around here so it makes sense, I guess. Well then. With that, Teresa began explaining. According to Teresa, knowing things about him was almost common knowledge. 
though, there were still a lot of points that were shrouded in darkness and there were not many who knew the details. But that was another reason why he was so popular. What Mir learned after fishing through the many rumors and fabricated stories was that the phantom thief Fuzzy Dice fell into the category of chivalrous thief. A thief who punishes corrupt and villainous people sounds like quite an eccentric personality in itself. Some say that he contributes a lot to an orphanage. I adore him so much. Teresa's voice increased in pitch like that of a maiden in love as she began clapping with her legs. Seeing her acting like that Mira returned her gaze to the card then looking away and deciding that a woman's mind was still a big mystery to her. After that there was just some idle chatter between the two as the train continued its ride. By the time the sun was setting and the presence of night began creeping into the train like some sort of mist they arrived at the next station. They were in the station city of East Ballad, the closest one parting from the Holy Gate. Mira and Teresa went their separate ways from the station square there of Mira going in a search for an inn. Judging from the remaining money she had, her available budget was below 10 feet oo rails. She had searched for in so many times in the past that she was already used it, so she quickly decided to stay on one called The Flowing Song, attracted by the stories sung by troubadours at the dining room. With that, the night grew late. 